Hello, everyone. It's common practice to thank the organizers for inviting me and present this conference. And this is more appropriate than ever um, because I'm really grateful to Nikolai to give me the chance to send a video and speak to you in this way. So what I want to present to you is a methodology that we developed recently for uh, analysis of proteomic data and especially to improve uh, proteome coverage and completeness. Um, I'm pretty sure I don't need to explain for this audience that data completeness is a major issue in proteomics in general and especially in single cell proteomics where um, especially in data dependent analysis um, we suffer from the stochasticity in, in data collection resulting in missing data in, in proteomic data and especially if the number of samples increases. Uh, so there are um, quite a number of efforts to solve this issue and improve uh, data completeness, arriving at a situation like, like this one here, where you um, um, have complete data and, and protein identification and quantification across all your samples. Um, and here are a number of approaches, how this um, has been achieved by data independent analysis, um, uh, peptide identity propagation of which I'll talk um, extensively in this presentation here. Uh, and imputation approaches to replace missing values with, with uh, values. Um, now for each of these um, approaches, although they are powerful each in their own way, uh, there are also some um, limitations. And for DIA, uh, this is the uh, fact that the data are highly convoluted and that this is um, difficult to interpret, although there are very powerful approaches and ever increasingly powerful approaches uh, around now that can handle these data. Um, peptide identity propagation has been around for a longer time um, and has been very uh, useful in workflows like for MaxQuant. I'll mention this later again. Um, but this, is, this suffers typically from limited sensitivity. And then imputation is, is a popular approach uh, to replace missing values by either zeros or by estimating um, intensities of uh, the data that are missed. But the limitation there is um, that absence of data can have many reasons and you need to select the uh, appropriate imputation tool to be able to handle this uh, correctly. So what I've been talking mostly about um, in this talk here is about peptide identity propagation um, because this has been um, used extensively although uh, there are alternative methods and approaches um, how this can don be done in another way and that um, uh, maybe even more powerful than the way it's done in, in, in MaxQuant. So just to get everyone on the same page, um, what I mean when I talk about peptide identity pro propagation, um, what I mean by this is uh, that you replace values and identities uh, between um, individual mass spec runs where one uh, run complements uh, missing information of the other. Uh, so for instance, you have a peak that has been identified in one and not in the other. And when it has the same retention time and the same mass, the assumption is that this is the same peptide um, and therefore you can uh, transfer the identity. And this can work both ways in, 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 in two samples um, to collectively then fill in these data and achieve higher data completeness. Um, so this can be done basically in two fundamental ways. Uh, one is feature-based pro uh, peptide identity propagation and the other is ion-based peptide identity propagation. And I just want to explain a bit the difference between them because that will be then important for the rest of the talk. Um, so feature-based um, uh, peptide identity propagation um, is based on detection of uh, peptide or of, of ion intensities as features. Um, so for instance, there is a precise match between retention, uh, of retention time and, and uh, mass, of, um, mass of a charge. Um, the peak has a Gaussian peak shape and there's an isotope pattern that you can recognize so that you can define the peak um, as a peptide. Um, this is different in um, ion-based um, identity propagation where you just re uh, rely on the, the uh, matching in time and uh, uh, mass. So without these requirements of peak definition. So I already mentioned that uh, mass quant and match between runs is a often used and very powerful way to apply this, this type of matching. Um, while DMXQ and ion star um, are two examples that um, include ion-based uh, propagation using dice 
so this is you know, more or less synony synonymous, so DAI standing for direct ion current extraction. So the advantage of, of feature-based ion propagation is identity propagation is the reliability. So you have solid fe uh, feature detection, um, which is then used for, uh, to assign peptide identity. The advantage of uh, ion-based detection, uh, on the other hand, is its sensitivity. And because you don't have these requirements, it can uh, sum up any intensity that falls within the region, uh, within a mass and uh, retention time region. So that at the same time then um, indicates the relatively uh, a bit of the disadvantage of feature-based uh, uh, methods that have a lower sensitivity. So what we wanted to do is actually combine the, the benefits of both. So to um, have the uh, feature-based approach um, and its reliability and combine this with the sensitivity of, of, of dyes. And this is what I will uh, show you in this presentation and explain how we implemented this and how we apply this to a number of, of applications, including single cell data. But just to explain a bit further um, um, in some more detail how both approaches, uh, so the ion and, and feature-based approaches handle uh, missing data. So in a conventional um, you know, matching um, an experiment, you have one sample where this, this this, this feature has been detected and the peptide has been identified because you have a good MSMS spectrum. While in the second sample, the feature has been detected, but you happen to have a poor spectrum, the peptide is not identified, but because it matches in time and mass, you can uh, apply this match matching runs and, and transfer the identity. Now consider this um, gray feature here that has been detected and even identified in sample one here. Um, but in sample two, it happens to be very low abundant and the feature was not detected as such. So what happens then, uh, that mass plant has a hard time, um, doesn't find the feature and there's no match between runs um, and you have a missing value. So here it's important then um, again to, to distinguish how uh, match between runs and dice approaches handle these, these data. So as I mentioned, um, a situation like this in a mass plant results in a missing value in this sample here. While in an ion-based approach, um, this would still extract the information from the expected window. So here in the, in, in the blue square, um, sum up the, the intensities and then still uh, transfer the, the identity from sample one. Now, as you can imagine now, um, this um, is a bit tricky because you need to know where you're actually looking. Uh, you need to be very sure that what you, uh, what you integrate here is actually the peak uh, that you think it is. Um, at the same time, it also explains why um, ion-based approaches um, um, uh, exhibit a better data coverage because it rescues these data, uh, these kind of peaks um, that are missed by feature detection programs or algorithms. Um, maybe this is also a good place to, to highlight or to, to emphasize that um, the notion that DDA approaches or the missing data are inherent to DDA approaches as opposed to DIA, um, which may not be completely justified because um, as you see here, this may be a missing value here, uh, but actually the information is there um, and we just you know, fail in extracting this information from our data. Um, and um, I think there's, that ion-based approaches may be a good way to, uh, uh, to improve that situation as I hope I will show you here. So um, just to indicate where, where this comes from and actually what inspired us to, to start with this, this study to start with. Um, and these are two tools that have been developed um, um, over the past few years. One called DMXQ developed in the Zubarev lab um, and one called Einstar in the Q lab in, in New York, in Buffalo, New York. Um, so they both um, explore and uh, apply this um, ion-based approach and what they both show is that in increased number of in larger you know, sample cohorts, you retain um, a good coverage of, of proteins. As now we need to look. So this DMXQ, yeah, it's a purple line here. Uh, so it only starts dropping off um, um, in this particular example where at 10 sam samples or so, but still in performs better than the traditional approaches like, like, like mask quantum others. 
Now on the right side is a beautiful example of, of iron star where they have an even a larger number of samples. I think this is around 100 samples where you see this beautiful map of fully covered um, um, protein identification. And this is of course a situation that we want to um, arrive at and that we want to achieve. Now, um, not surprisingly, both approaches uh, focus on the chromatographic alignment because this is um, of extreme importance to achieve reliable and accurate uh, data in this kind of situations. They do this in different ways. So in DMXQ, they um, uh, use part of the OpenMS pipeline um, uh, for uh, chromatographic alignment. Um, and then uh, they use this to recover missing values um, by this DICE approach. Um, and then they use um, a scoring algorithm to um, look at deviations over features and peptides. Um, they deviate from the expected retention time mass and uh, variance in abundance. Uh, conceptually, INSTAR does a similar thing, but using different implementation of, of um, um, methodologies. So the chromatographic alignment is done by Chromaline, which is part of SIEV, uh, which is the uh, a thermal tool. And also they do um, extensive post feature generation quality control um, to reject outliers, among other things. Um, so we were highly motivated to uh, to implement one or even both of, them, of these approaches, but this turned out to be rather difficult. Uh, we've been in touch with the Zubarev lab to uh, implement DMXQ, but this turned out to be very cumbersome and even with their help did not get this to work. Um, and for Einstar, as I mentioned, this relies on Sieve, which is um, a software tool that is no longer um, uh, supported by Thermo, so we didn't have access to this. Um, so also this um, unfortunately, we didn't have access to, which is unfortunate because they produce beautiful data and it would be great to um, uh, to apply this on a more general uh, in a more general ma manner. So we thought um, we should look into this and um, um, maybe develop something um, that is easier accessible and, and user friendly. And this is how we um, design the approach that I'm going to show you now. Um, as in DMXQ and, uh, and Ironstar, the, the, the heart of this tool is uh, really to handle um, alignment of LCMS runs. The way this is done typically is uh, nonlinear retention time alignment, as can be done by, by a number of tools, um, showing one of them to correct for deviations in, in retention time uh, profiles. What many of these tools do not do is look for uh, sample and feature specific retention time shifts and um, uh, mass shifts, which may happen to different loadings or variation in um, you know, local um, variation in, in, in columns, et cetera. Um, and it would be really important to um, monitor this and control for this if needed. So this is something that we want to include, implement in our uh, tool. Um, so what I'm going to show you is really the work of uh, Matthias Kalkstorff, who has been a postdoc in my lab, who, who left uh, recently, unfortunately. Um, but he did a great job, um, as I hope I can convince you here. And what I'll be showing you here is um, um, ICER, so standing for Ion Current Extraction Requantification. Um, and uh, that combines robust feature alignment with sensitive quant uh, feature quantification for uh, uh, dice-based uh, peptide and protein quantification. Um, so to achieve this, what I'll be talking about is what is happening under the hood and uh, how, we, how we achieve better data completeness starting from a situation like this. So it, it includes a large number of steps, which may not be surprising. And um, I'll, um, you cannot read this here, but I'll highlight and explain uh, some of the essential parts in the next couple of slides. Uh, what I want to mention here is uh, just the key features so that you have an idea of where this is heading to. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, we have both a global and a sample and feature specific alignment um, so that we can have narrow windows, time and mass windows, which improves the, the, the accuracy of the DICE approach. Also, it combines feature-based and ion-based um, peptide identity propagation uh, to have the benefit of both. Um, so the robustness and the sensitivity. Um, and then on top of this, we have a number of scoring schemes to assess the reliability of the quantification um, to determine noise levels um, and distinguish the presence of peptides from 
random ion occurrences or noise. Um, it includes, um, so it is, you can use um, uh, uh, Orbitrap type data, uh, but also Timslov data. So including the eye mobility dim dimension, which is, I think a unique uh, feature that is not present in the other two tools that I mentioned. And this is all um, provided in, a, in a, um, our Shiny app and uh, providing uh, a easy to use graphical use user interface as I'll show at the very end. So now going into some detail. Um, so this starts with uh, what, what you need as an input is uh, mass count output tables. Uh, so the peptide and, and, and uh, protein tables along with the raw files from your mass spectrometer. Uh, from which um, ISA will requantify uh, data that were not, not uh, covered in the maximum output file. Um, so it does a, a global alignment of, of features in um, mass and uh, retention time, and then groups these features um, uh, together, um, either identified or not identified by MaxQuant, um, and then um, uh, stores these as what are then called ISO features. What we also do is to uh, look at the M1, M plus one isotope uh, to uh, um, increase coverage and, and confidence and also to um, improve the statistical power. Um, and then what is an essential part is to um, correct for deviation in mass and retention time, especially for the features that were not identified in mass quant and for which we need to estimate or predict what their, their variance is. Um, so that is what is done in these uh, uh, random forest and uh, generalized additive models for uh, both uh, variation in uh, mass and retention time as shown here on the right side um, for mass prediction, which uh, uh, is highly reproducible and also for uh, modeling of the retention time you see that can be done uh, uh, quite efficiently, and also what it shows here is one example where the, the um, uh, retention time drifts as the uh, gradient progresses. So this is the situation where um, ion-based uh, identity propagation would have a hard time. Um, so what we then implement as a next step is the um, feature-based ion propagation, uh, identity propagation as a first step to um, assign identity to uh, uh, to, to features that were not directly identified by, by MSMS. So um, transferring the identity as is done in, in MaxQuant essentially. Um, and then on top, we um, uh, do a background noise estimation, which will be important later on to uh, distinguish uh, features from background and to do a quality control for the uh, quantification events. And also it will allow us to um, determine uh, signal to noise um, intensities, which will be important for uh, data evaluation um, afterwards. So this is what, uh, how it look, looks like. So how, how the background is modeled. Um, basically how, how it achieves this is by uh, taking random snapshots um, away from the uh, dice windows themselves to estimate or predict well, determined from the data, um, uh, the noise that is present there to be able to correct for this afterwards. Then an important aspect of um, ICER is the uh, local um, alignment um, and, and correction. So this, as I mentioned, this is not something that is implemented in, in other software tools, um, but it is something to, to take into consideration. So the um, systematic, um, shifts, I think, is a common common uh, uh, aspect that is uh, taken into account by other uh, alignment uh, uh, algorithms. Um, but what you also would like to account for is the sample and feature specific uh, shifts, both in retention time um, and in mass. And this may be important for um, a number of instances where after alignment, you end, end up with ambigu ambiguities where it's well, hard to decide how you would do the matching uh, because that's not a perfect match um, um, that directly points to a feature that um, uh, can be directly um, uh, connected to its you know, broader feature in the in the parallel sample. So how do we handle this? 
So this is why a local feature and, and sample specific alignment um, approach is, is implemented. Um, and what is, how this is um, achieved here is by the use of, of kernel density estimation. Um, so which looks for, for intensities um, that is both sensitive and also robust for um, noise signals in the, in the uh, 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 that it can ac account for. And after, after um, peak detection by this kernel, de kernel density estimation, it uh, sums these up and then determines the intensity. I have one example here to illustrate this. Uh, so how this, um, why this is important and um, how this improves the data. So this is an example of um, um, a data set. So the IPRG, one of the IPRG studies from a few years back where they uh, provided samples um, where um, E. coli uh, proteins were spiked in, in different concentrations. So what you see here are 12 samples um, and highlighting here the kernel density maps for one of these peptides from LEXI, um, indicating with the squares where these um, um, peaks would be, would be expected, detected, and what eventually in the red square uh, was selected by ISO. So what you see here is that only in a limited number of cases, indicated with the green squares here, um, that these were identified um, by mass quant. So considered as known. Well, this was not the case in sample one, two, one, two and three and 10, 11 and 12. Now what ISO was able to do is to, um, uh, to identi identify these um, uh, features here that were slightly deviating and assign them to this, this peptide here. So I, you may wonder uh, how we can rely, this now, rely on this now and how we can explain this difference. Um, but what, is, um, what happens to be the case is that these um, uh, peptides here that were identified by Marx quant actually originated from the highest concentration of, of this peptide. Well, in sample one, two, and three, this concentration was like 30 fold lower. So this probably explains why it was missed by Marx quant. Um, the same also for 10, 10, 11, 12, which was a lower concentration. So this clearly um, uh, shows the benefit of ISO that it can rescue these identifications and quantify them. So after doing all this, um, ISO has a number of um, controls and checks uh, and uh, to, to, to correct for outliers, uh, for instance, and for, um, uh, to assess the quality of the quantification. So it does this by making use of um, uh, the, uh, the, no the noise levels that are determined uh, compared, compared to intensities in dice windows and then determining um, in a statistical way um, what a chance are that certain intensities are identified by chance in a dice window and then assign a p-value to this. Um, also, it determines um, uh, uh, signal to noise as a, as a measure for um, the quality of the quantification. And then across all samples, what it does is to, um, to look if the, uh, features are in all within the expected uh, retention time mass range. And if there's any outliers, um, these are excluded from, from the data. Usually this is only a, a very low percentage. Finally, another feature that is implemented is um, that we determine FDR of peak selection. And the way this is done and this shown on the right here is by um, masking the peak location as it has been determined by mass quant as a kind of ground, goal, uh, like ground truth. Um, Thereby, thereby removing the, uh, feature, the possibility to do the feature-based alignment um, and then to see if without the, the, the peak location, how well the dice-based approach is able to reproduce to assign the, the peptide identity and then do this for a couple of hundred um, uh, peaks in the sample. And how this, uh, what this results in is shown on the right here for this particular IPRG sample. Um, is that this is typically below 1%. And this we've also seen for, for other data sets. Yeah, so the, the, um, uh, the peak assignment and uh, uh, identity transfer uh, is highly reliable. Okay, now having this all in place, um, what does it result in? Um, 
clearly it's an improvement in the uh, retention time deviation, so it's a threefold three improvement in the standard deviation, also for the deviation in mass, like a twofold improvement. Um, and then in terms of the number of identified peptides that's indicated in the, in the middle bar plot here, so in orange, so these are the peptides that are peptides that are directly sequenced by uh, MS2. Then on gray are the peptides that are um, uh, rescued by match between runs. And then in the light blue um, is the peptide, the, 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 the feature-based identi identity transfer by ICER. So it's a decent portion and only you know, 12 or 15%, but still a, a decent fraction is then rescued by the ion-based um, identity transfer. But as you can also see, overall, the number of peptides that we that you identify is like a twofold higher than what you would get from um, the mass quant only uh, approach. So that's about identification. Also on the quantitative side, um, the accuracy of the quantification is, is higher in, in ICER, as you can see um, here, where the deviation from the expected uh, ratio is smaller for ICER than for um, other approaches. Okay, so now having this, um, how can we um, assess now the um, performance of ICER um, on a number of, of reference data sets? And without going to a lot of detail, uh, so we have in, a, in, in the paper that will appear soon, um, an extensive uh, comparison to a range of other software, software tools, not only MassQuant, also uh, PD with the upgrant label free quantification, um, um, tool that is included there. MS Fregger, also DMXQ, as far as we, um, um, but then limited to the data that they provided. The same for Einstar, um, and also compared to DIA, I'll show some data in a second, and also compare this to performance of various imputation methods. Um, <clears throat> so here we um, compared the perform performance of ICER to a spiking data set that was uh, t um, uh, generated to, the, to test Einstar, so it's coming from their publication here. Um, and we can see here that um, in terms of data completeness, ICER comes pretty close um, in terms of uh, the fraction of missing values. Um, um, Einstar is at 0% here and ICER at 0.1 or for 2 uh, or 0.2% at the protein or peptide level. So it's a very big improvement compared to MassQuant alone and coming very close to what they showed for ion star. Um, also in terms of specificity and, and sensitivity here in this rock curve, um, ISO performs really well um, uh, compared to the, uh, the tools here with or without imputation. And uh, looking at the true uh, positives rate and false positive rate, um, uh, determined by two different approaches here, Lima and Pekka. Um, ISA performs really well, uh, where you see um, a high uh, true positive rate compared to uh, other approaches um, and simultaneously a low uh, false positive rate. It's also shown on the right here in absolute numbers, um, where ISA here has a, you know, stands out by having a good ratio of false positive over uh, true positive over false positives. As I mentioned, um, ISA can also handle eye mobility data, which is, is um, I think, a unique aspect. Um, and also here, um, uh, ISA performs really well. So combination uh, of uh, high uh, true positives and low false positives, again, identified or determined by two different approaches. And as displayed here in this, uh, in this bar plot here, which again is a spike in um, a data set of E. coli in human samples that we generated for this purpose to generate the data for this analysis um, uh, with a, a good ratio of um, uh, a true positive over false positives with very low missing values. Um, now we, we uh, seen the performance of, of ICER. We also compared it to um, uh, DIA and to see how far it could approach this. And um, um, I think we come pretty close. So for this, we used um, a data set that came from uh, uh, this paper here um, that they used to um, assess the performance of um, uh, Spectronaut. Sorry, almost failing the name, Spectronaut. 
Um, so here you see, um, again, specific, uh, this rock curve here, where I comes pretty close to the performance of, uh, of, of spectral knots. And in terms of missing values, um, it's even a bit lower. So then finally, coming to applications of ISER. Um, <clears throat> So I, I, I'll show you two examples. One is in a global proteome analysis and the second one um, for single cell analysis. So this is um, an anal analysis or data set that we took from this paper uh, from the Mann lab where they uh, did a plasma proteome analysis um, um, across 32 samples. Um, and uh, in, in, in their approach, um, uh, using mass quant, seeing a dropping number of uh, proteins that could be consistently identified uh, across all these samples. So it's 195 proteins that were uh, identified in all 32 samples here. So now we're to this same data set. When we um, analyze this with ICER, we see that we can increase the number of proteins and um, uh, that are uh, identified in all samples. But it's important to note that this is actually uh, true for all um, um, at all levels. So it, it globally increases the number of, of identifications. It's not what you would see when you would use um, uh, um, imputation methods where you would have a straight line, ideally uh, starting from here, but, I, but generally speaking, uh, the overall number of, of proteins is increased when um, using ICER, benefiting from its uh, uh, sensitivity to, to detect these proteins. Um, now, considering uh, this situation here, where we have uh, full data completeness, we get 50 proteins uh, in addition, which is like 25%, so it's a decent number. Um, and when we look into this, what these, these, these proteins are and what their patterns are, um, this end ends up like this. So we see low abundance peptides um, that where we can fill in the quantitative data across all samples. Um, but you know, somewhat surprisingly, maybe, um, this also happened for higher abundant proteins, which were somehow missed um, um, in the conventional approach. And one explanation for this may be that is, these are um, peptides that don't meet the criterion for uh, quantification by two peptides, maybe because one of them was missed in one or more samples, and that we can then rescue in, in an ICER approach. So it illustrates that we cannot only fill um, the data in the horizontal axis here, but also in the vertical, uh, vertical axis um, across the, the, the uh, also into the higher abundance range. Now the second example and probably most uh, uh, of most interest to you is um, uh, an application of ICER to single cell data. And what we uh, selected here was a paper uh, that was published um, a few years ago from a lab in Portland, um, analyzing hair cells at the single cell level. And the mass spec analysis was done by uh, Ryan Kelly using his um, uh, nanopods approach. What they were interested in is um, in how cells, uh, hair cells are developed from progenitor cells in the, uh, in the support layer here. And they use a, a dye with this name FM143 uh, a green dye that, that preferentially uh, stains uh, hair cells as opposed to, uh, to progenitor cells, allowing them to affect sodium um, for high and low um, uh, stained cells, um, put them on the nanopods uh, chip, and then do um, uh, a proteome analysis on the single cell level. Now, these are kind of the numbers um, that they uh, achieve in that paper using a mass quant approach. Um, identifying a few dozen uh, proteins with a median of, of 23 and the peptide level median of, of 100. Um, I should say that they do not use um, uh, imputation here, probably for a good reason, uh, to not distort the data and make assumptions and make false assumptions why these, why, why these data are missing. So these are the numbers that they end up with. Now, when we apply uh, ICER on these data, uh, we, the data, these numbers can be significantly increased um, to in median 433 proteins and 413 that were um, um, identified in all uh, all samples, all single cells. So it's a it's a drastic increase, giving a uh, uh, a much greater depth um, uh, of of the protein that we can see here. In terms of missing data, there's also a great improvement. Um, so this yeah fraction of missing values goes down from over 90% to below 10 or even at, at in the 
percent range for at the peptide level. So of course, this gives a lot of power to analyze the data um, um, in, by statistical means. So a TSNI analysis where the separation between these green uh, hair cells and progenitor cells is more clear um, than before, with maybe with this one exception here. Um, and also an, an interesting uh, 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 question that they addressed in the paper is if they can derive developmental trajectories uh, from these single cell data using an approach called cell trails and which assigns um, cells to um, pseudo time um, during development. And this, this is the figure that they, uh, uh, the, from their paper, where they uh, considered 75% that were the 75 uh, proteins that were detected in at least five cells. Um, identifying proteins that were known uh, to be either in the progenitor cells or specific for hair cells. Now we have over 400 proteins that we can quantify in all 14 cells that were um, in the data set, uh, where um, a much more refined picture emerges, um, especially here in the middle, um, in this transition state, where probably these intensities are much lower, uh, but that can now be still quantified using the ISO approach. And on the right side, there's a few examples um, showing expression or intensities of a few of these proteins. So this protein here is uh, specific for the precursor state. Um, so higher abundance here, and this is what we can, we can reproduce and can see. And uh, for these two at the bottom here, it's the other way around. So these are hair cells, hair cell specific, and we can see higher intensity um, um, in the hair cells. And this is an interesting example um, um, of, of a protein that um, is more in this intermediate uh, state here, where the intensity actually is higher. Um, uh, at, at, you know, midway through the through the development. Uh, to visualize this in another way, so these are iron density maps of a number of peptides from our uh, uh, ISO data. So select ISO, uh, dice windows for a few of these these peptides, and they are um, aligned sorted by uh, pseudo time alignment. Um, so as you can see, uh, the densities um, are really present. They are seeing is believing. <laughs> um, and so this is, um, again, a hair, hair cell specific peptide where you see uh, still some intensity um, in the progenitor cells, the other way around here for this peptide here, uh, clearly absent here, um, but still having a quantitative value from ICER. Um, below are two examples here uh, indicating which peptide or which uh, uh, situations which cases were actually seen by Muscont indicated by the M uh, while the rest was missed and um, now with ISER we can cover the entire uh, uh, sample set and get quantitative values uh, from each of them. So getting to the end uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, showing um, how this all looks when you would you know download and, and start using ISER so it has a uh, simple and intuitive uh, graphical user interface as shown here. What it requires you to do is to um, indicate if you have Orbitrap or, or Timstoff data, uh, you give it a name, uh, you need to indicate where you have your raw files, your muscon folder, and where you want to have the results. And then actually the only variables that you need to uh, um, indicate is here the, the retention time and mass windows that you would consider, and the resolution for the uh, kernel density estimation and the number of threads that you want to uh, dedicate in your computer to do the analysis. Uh, so it's really very few. And I, um, I should say that all the analysis that we um, that I've shown here and that we have um, in the upcoming paper were actually all done with, with uh, default settings, so not even touching these and indicating that this is uh, uh, sufficient to analyze highly diverse data sets from plasma proteomes to single cell data and acquired with very different um, experimental settings and on different um, instruments. So you can have a look here um, if you want to have some more uh, detailed information and or if you want like to give it a try. So some conclusions. Um, so I think this exemplifies and I'm sure you're having the, this, these um, discussions there at, at your meeting that pro progress in single cell proteomics benefits from joint improvements in you know, all aspects of the workflow. Clearly, sample preparation has received a lot of information, a lot of attention in the last years. 
um, improvement and in LCMS getting more sensitive analysis, but also in data analysis, as you know, I'm underscoring here, um, where analysis of the same data with um, um, a different tool and hopefully an improved tool can give you um, much improved data. Um, so uh, I think this may also indicate that label-free single cell proteomics um, may be possible with, with a tool like ICER. Um, and although TMT labeling is great, may, it may be also reasons <clears throat> uh, why it, it, uh, you would like to avoid this. So uh, um, avoiding um, handling steps or adding uh, uh, reagents to your samples, um, or if you don't want to bother about booster channels and how to use them, um, so this will be interesting and something that we will you know, try to follow up in the, in the coming period. Um, so other things that we'd like to uh, do and to de develop ICER for the future, uh, we have already a uh, kind of working version for, for SILIC data. Um, we want to look into the um, you know, peak alignment and to see if we can um, apply this in a 3D kind of pattern recognition uh, to improve the specificity. An interesting idea is to see if ICER can uh, also perform in MS1 only data. Yeah? So then relying on the, the, uh, the dice identity propagation um, exclusively from a reference uh, data set, which, which may give highly, uh, give, give advantages in sensitivity and the number of data points that you can use for quantification across uh, chromatographic peaks. And um, yeah, as I indicated, this is now uh, taking MaxQuant data as an input, uh, but of course it would also be great. And there's no reason why it you know, principally wouldn't work uh, to accept other types of uh, process data from uh, raw mass spec data. Uh, so with this, I'm coming to the end, really um, uh, thanking Matthias because uh, clearly this has all been his work. I thank the rest of my group for uh, some of the testing and uh, the discussions and generating ideas um, and I thank you for uh, listening. I, again, I apologize for not being able to be there and joining the discussions. Um, I have already seen the announcement for the single sign meeting next year. Uh, so hopefully um, I can be there and uh, see you there or hopefully see you at another occasion. Um, yeah, now it's a bit awkward situation because there will be no chance for asking questions, uh, but I can imagine that you have a few. Uh, so in that case, um, don't hesitate to drop me an email and I'll be happy to answer and discuss. Thanks a lot for your attention and have a great meeting there.